we've had a generation of politicians who can never say anything meaningful in front of people. I mean, I spend a certain amount of my life on shows with politicians, and I know, imagine those that basically you see it in their eyes. Yeah. The aim is to survive the next half hour. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's 18 years since I wrote my first book, and um, something in my own professional life, I'm not that old, but something in my own professional life has very fundamentally changed in that time. And it's, I've been trying to work out how to sum it up, and it's something like this. I was, when I started becoming a writer, aware that to be a writer or to be a good writer, you should make sure that you write in such a way that no honest critic cannot can mis misrepresent what you have said. That if you're a public speaker, no honest critic could misrepresent honestly the content of your speech. And something has changed. I think it's information technology, social media and more. Something has changed in the last couple of decades to get us to the situation I would now summarize as everyone who writes and speaks in public has to write and speak in a manner that ensures that a dishonest critic couldn't dishonestly misrepresent what you've said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. basically cannot be done. It's an almost impossible task. Mm -hmm. And I try to resist this as, as a writer and try to continue to say what I think, but even, even I'm aware of occasions when I might shave something off. Um, an example... Self-censor? Yeah, I mean, there's an example, let me give you one just quite recently. Some years ago at a Friends Memorial Service, a, 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 a great son of this country, Barry Humphreys, was giving a, a eulogy and he read a poem and um, it's one of the only times I've burst out laughing at a memorial service. Uh, <laughs> Barry Humphreys read this poem that our late friend had wanted him to read and it was an E.E. E. Cummings poem and it was sort of four lines and it was it made no sense. And all of us sitting in the congregation were sort of... Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Barry Humphreys read these four lines and then at the end said, I've no idea what that poem means. <laughs> but he said, if there's anyone here who does understand and can tell me, I will give them a box of black magic chocolates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> None of us had heard of black magic chocolates for years. <laughs> Pretty they're they're still around. Anyhow, yeah. with some friends, it, it became the sort of thing. We often used to joke, you know, whoever's late to dinner has to give everyone else a box of black <laughs> magic chocolates or whatever. Anyhow. By the way, to our American audience, uh, Barry Humphreys uh, was the man behind Dame Edna, which is probably what they would know. Uh, he's, he's bafflingly uh, unfamous in the States. Well, it, it's their fault for being ignorant about that. <laughs> uh, um, so, anyway... The reason I tell you this story is because um, some time ago I was writing a piece and I, I was being rude about something or someone and I said at some point, um, and I give a box of black magic chocolates to whoever can come up with the answer to this. And I just realised, first of all, not everyone was in on the joke, obviously. Secondly, it was sort of fun enough, but the main thing was I suddenly thought there's just no point in saying black magic chocolates. I just should change it to like Roses or Quality Street or something. And I, and I told this to a black friend of mine who was like, you did what? <laughs> and I was just like, well, I just thought like somebody might think, why would he choose black magic chocolates? There's something sinister about that. It's, it's you know, and I just thought, well, why, why risk any hassle? So I just threw in Quality Street or something. <laughs> Anyhow, the point is that, is that you can't really do that. You can't right in order that some absolute maniac won't yeah. dishonestly accuse you of something you're not guilty of. So, so if I feel that, uh, um, I, I know that a lot of other people do. The other thing is that, the other thing that's really stopping conversation these days is the idea that you can't speak about any experience that isn't your own. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of breakdown, the identity politics reduction, which means unless you're a woman, you can't speak about anything to do with women, unless you're a man, you, et etc. et cetera, unless you're this color, you can't do, talk about that. Unless you're this religion, you can't talk about that. Unless that's your sexual practice and orientation, you can't talk about that. Which just, it's forever cutting off conversation which actually is connected to all of us. You know, we're not these weird subsections. We're also a society. We're also, you know, we're also communities beyond that kind of breakdown. And this, this is making almost all discussion very difficult. And it comes back to what Majid just said, which is, the cost of entry is being made too high 
for most people. That's my general view. Yeah. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if somebody watches what Majid has put up with in the work he's done, like, why would you do that? Why would you get into that? It's, it happens to be one of the most important things you could get into, but why would you put up with that crap? You know, you could, you could go off and do something else. And th this is one of the, the great successes of the, uh, of, of the people who've pushed back against Majid, who've pushed back on all of us in some way. And just one other thing, which is worth throwing out there, which is what I call the YouTubization of discussion. Um, and the YouTubization of discussion goes something along these lines. Um, it happens to me sometimes, by the way. I'm sometimes on YouTube and I'll be looking for the latest uh, clip of Eric Weinstein or um, Stein. 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 <laughs> oh my God, I just Stein, I just Stein Steined you. Yeah. Um, forever, anyhow, forever Stein. Eric, I'll be looking up <laughs> on um, on YouTube, and, and sometimes there's something that will come up, and it'll be like ten times Douglas Murray annihilated someone or something. <laughs> or watch Douglas Murray destroy this person. And I suddenly go, oh, I wonder what I did then. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I click, and I don't do this often, by the way. <laughs> it's only, only like most days, no. But, but I, I, I click sometimes, and I go, oh, well, that, that's just what we used to call a discussion. Yep. Um, yeah, but yeah. it's presented in that way, and, and very rarely do you actually annihilate someone on mm. television. But... The problem about this is it seeps into the general discourse, and I notice people now do this in television studios. They go on in order to have the YouTube excerpt of it announced as mm. X destroys Y utterly and makes mm. him cry. Mm. And most discussion sorry, isn't your, like that. But in your case, it really is. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, okay. Anyhow, but that, ma that makes it very difficult as well, because people, are, as, as somebody said, are, are auditioning for another medium. Just mm. talking of auditions, I've just got to make very clear. I did audition today to come here as a woman, but it, it didn't <laughs> accept my application. Well. So I noticed that... You know. It's, you're yeah, you're going to have to work harder at it, I would say. You're yeah. not really pulling it off. I, I, it is a... <laughs> you, can, you can transition at any point in this conversation. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> That's what's going to give it the gender balance. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I didn't really answer your question. You right? answer, I mean, I answered a load of other questions of my close. own invention. I don't even think the word immigration appeared in your answer yeah, yeah, once. Yes. I don't remember. We'll, we'll treasure that moment. <laughs> An incredibly um, novel position on immigration, yeah, just uh, articulated by Douglas Murray. Um, but we can. But I think you raised some interesting issues, which I want to come back to. And uh, so, Eric, one thing that I think that you could speak to here is. Um, I've been interested in your sort of defense of disagreeableness. In other words, do you want to take on the question of civility itself? In other words, <laughs> whether or not we can have civil conversations about incivility and civility. I mean, lately it seems like we can't even talk about whether or not we should be being civil without being uncivil about that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of chicken and egg in our future on this one. Um, I, you know, there's an old definition of a gentleman as a... Uh, a man who's never rude by accident. And um, it's very important that incivility be a spice and not a substrate or a main course. Um, so once in a blue moon, uh, it's perfectly uh, reasonable to eviscerate someone when they are behaving badly. And it's, in fact, necessary for civility um, to forcibly let people know that you're quite unhappy. I, I think that the bigger issue here uh, has to do with something that, like, what can't we, what really can't we talk about? If you think about what happened in medicine, we had this concept of um, iatrogenic um, outcomes, where the harm was done by the hospital, the healer, the nurse, the medicine. And there was a tremendous amount of harm done by people in the healing professions, and this was very confusing. It's sort of a, it's a kind of societal. Uh, autoimmune disease. You, you want medicine, you want hospitals, you want healers, and in fact they were doing a tremendous amount of harm, and it was very difficult to talk to your priestly class and say, wow, you guys are totally out of control and you're killing people like crazy. Um, what is making this so difficult is what I would call uh, journogenic effects. That is, everything that we do passes through this kind of sense-making apparatus 
And the sense-making apparatus is suffering from some kind of crazy autoimmune disease where we absolutely need journalism. I mean, make no mistake about it. We need journalists, we need journalism. And what we have is crowding out the journalism that we need. So it's very confusing, right? Because at some level, you hear somebody like President Trump saying, you know, the press is the enemy. And in some weird way, he's right, and in some weird way, he's terribly wrong. So, you know, if you take, if you take Majid's situation, um, it's only confusing to Majid because he hasn't studied uh, quantum mechanics deeply enough to realize that he's <laughs> Schrodinger's Muslim. Um, <laughs> I told you he was the maths nerd of the Marvel group. <laughs> and, you know, poor Douglas didn't understand that he, he needed uh, magic chocolates of color and then everything would be fine. Um, <laughs> We're in some situation where we're trying to figure out what can we say so that we do not find ourselves tomorrow hating our own existence because we've wound up in some previously respectable paper or, or news program completely misportrayed. So let me just ask you, how many people here, like I'm sitting on the far right of this panel, how many people here are on the far right? Okay. <laughs> how many people here are the alt-right? Okay, tomorrow, there's going to be a paper that says, <laughs> if anybody covers this at all, mm -hmm. you know, a collection of six intellectuals was assembled on stage as a gateway drug to the alt-right. Popular <laughs> with the alt-right. Go on, alt-right, alt-right, alt-right. Now, by perseverating, by just repeating something over and over again, like, are there any women in the audience tonight? <laughs> okay, technically you don't exist. I'm sorry to say it. <laughs> because you're all frustrated white male incels. <laughs> you don't know this, but it will happen, right? And, you know, we had our, our, our friend Jordan Peterson uh, talking to Nellie Bowles of the New York Times, um, who, you know, who preceded uh, the esteemed Sarah Jung uh, into, into this august paper of, of record. Um, and he, of course, used the phrase enforced monogamy. So what was he going to do with enforced monogamy? He was going to redistribute hot females to incapable males to solve the problem of potentially dangerous mass murderers in Canada. Now, I say this sort of jokingly, but it's really not a joke. I mean, these people are absolutely insane, right? It's complete insanity, and it's insanity in the heart of our sense-making apparatus. It's Wait, like, why did, is it insane? Sorry, Martin. Did he, you, just, you tweeted something, didn't you, explaining what enforced monogamy meant in a, bio, well, in a sociological or anthropological sense? Well, I, I didn't yeah. want to do that, in fact. Yeah, I retweeted you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> did I you? did. <laughs> you did your part. <laughs> a moment of... Dave, dangerous Muslim, non-Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> retweets psychopathic Jew. You um, might need to explain. <laughs> <laughs> We got a good thing going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in this situation, what I did was I, I said, you know, enforced, enforced monogamy is not, it's not unknown to evolutionary theory, but it's, it's certainly a term that I've heard before, I guess, it's coming out of anthropology. So I figured the New York Times would probably have used this exact reserved term. So all I did was put in yeah. the reserved term in quotes, enforced monogamy. Sure enough, I get two results, both of them positive from previous articles in the New York Times, one of which was talking about uh, reforms in Afghanistan, Afghanistan which were pro-female, and the other one was talking about uh, breeding in fruit flies, which was again, you know, extended to the idea that this would be a positive thing. So these people are on both sides of the aisle. The real thing that's happening is, is that you have this thing which I call the alt-right, with W-R-I-T-E, right? And what it does is it takes this alternate sense-making collective, which is what I think the intellectual dark web is, and it misportrays it because it's not reporting on us. It says, oh, you're a competitor. We have a, a job to do, which is to take you out. And the whole problem of this thing is they didn't count on a large collection of people who disagree about very many things, who have different shades, different genders, different sexual orientations, getting along, and shoving a middle finger in their face and saying, you're not getting away with this. And furthermore, what we're finding out, we are just the advanced wing of this group that you all are, right? This is what I call IDW Nation. It's people, yeah, it's people who are coming, you're all over the world, we can have meetups, 
people can find each other. There's no reason to continue to live in fear of what I call the Chihuahua effect, where, which Brett was talking about. You've got this tiny number of very vocal, annoying people. I mean, I did a, I did a poll on Twitter, and I said, if you have an issue uh, between gender and sex, and you have two groups that could adjudicate it, one is gender studies and one is biology, who would you trust? Well, 50% of the comments are like, oh my God, you don't even get the difference between gender and sex, you're so offensive, you're so backward, thanks grandpa, blah, blah, blah. Also comments about my hair, which I really don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing is, is that 50% of the comments didn't correspond to the 60,000 people who wrote in where only 5% of them trusted gender studies over biology, right? right. So this is the whole thing, is, is that you're living in a gas-lit illusion. And the big problem is you've lost your sense-making apparatus. Now, we are not set up to cover the world's news. We're not set up to you know, teach full courses at a university. That may happen at some point. But fundamentally, what we're trying to do is take back the sense-making apparatus. And what you really need to do is to look for this journogenic corruption of sense-making because it's a tiny network of people that has crawled into your sense-making apparatus the way a hermit crab crawls into a shell that you already know. Well, it's got a new inhabitant, and it's going to derange everything if you continue mm -hmm. to let it. And what all, all I ask is, take the 5% of you that are the bravest, that are the most financially secure, and raise your voices. Like it, this can be the nucleation event where you know, this is the largest public gathering of us that has ever taken place. Thank you, Australia. Let this be the nucleating event. And this is what will take back this journogenic harm that is coming out of uh, our organs that should be uh, giving us sense, but are actually giving us nonsense and deranging us as Iago deranged uh, Othello against Desdemona. God, I love these people. We're a very Shakespearean country. <laughs> I would, I, would, uh, I would just wonder whether or not the, uh, the failings of the conventional mainstream media that you call insane and you seem to think are, uh, are, occur out of a sort of, sort of sense of feeling threatened by the conversations that you guys are having are actually better attributable just to mediocrity, groupthink and laziness and sloppiness. I mean, as someone who works in the establishment professional media myself, I can, get, I mean, in that article that you were alluding to with Jordan in the New York Times, mm -hmm. uh, the journalist didn't even explain why she thought that enforced monogamy would be a bad thing. She wrote, I scoffed and laughed because it's all so absurd. I'm paraphrasing, but that was sort of That's the gist of the line. Mm -hmm. And then she didn't go on to explain why it's absurd. She assumes that every single person reading that is automatically going to agree with her and just be laughing and scoffing. Well, I wasn't laughing and scoffing. I wanted to know what she thought if she wanted to... If she wants to tell me that it's absurd, then she has to explain why it's absurd. To me, that is just the assumption that, you're in, that everyone agrees with you and you're blind to your own bubble. Uh, really, it's, not, it's not feeling threatened. I'm right? sorry. Uh, so you, you want to know about disagreeability? I want to take the other side of this. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. No, th th this lady first called up Brett and then she called up me. And she had something that she really wanted to write. She wanted to write about uh, MRAs, right? Now, I did not know what an MRA was. And she said, well, of course, you, you know, you're, you're an important MRA. And I said, I don't even own a gun. And she said, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not, not National Rifle Association, men's rights advocate. I said, huh? Or activist or something. I don't even know what it is, right? So the, the point is, we have, a, we have an ugly suit, and we'd like to fit you into it. And the answer is, well, yeah. I decline. I, I, I do not wish to wear your ugly suit. Well, you can't do that. We're the New York Times, and, and we're the paper of record. And my feeling is, no, you're just some lady, and you're not really particularly good at what it is that you do. And that's your problem. Now, in the case of Ezra Klein, he just gave a defense of Sarah Jung. And I did not know this. Boy, did I learn a lot from this article. I, I really also, to, uh, just to people who haven't been following the Sarah Jong yeah. thing or who aren't on Twitter quite as much as, yeah. we, as we are or who are listening in the future. How many of you guys have heard about Sarah Jong? Yeah. You're raising your hands. I can't see like, anything. <laughs> in <this>. Shout. <laughs> <laughs> All just, right. uh, who wants That's to explain it briefly? Sarah, Sarah yeah. Jong, uh, we did not know. She, was, she came out of, um, I guess, Vox, 
the Vox Group. I mean, just keeping it very brief, she's someone who's, who the New York Times has hired to, their to the editorial board. board, one of the most important positions in terms of shaping the opinion of the paper. And it turned out that over the course of some years, several years ago, she, uh, she tweeted things that were, were anti-white racism. Things like all white people should... All white men, I think, should cancel die. Cancel, yeah. cancel all white people. Kill all white men and stuff yeah. like that, which be basically okay. apparently means... Well, and what I was going to get at is she, she came out of some group that was like snarky, you know, and sassy. And <laughs> snarky and sassy yeah. meant that you had you ha like hashtag kill all men. And yeah. like, haha, yeah. -ha, yeah. okay. Well, you could say, well, hashtag Pepe, you know. Um, well, no, no, no. Pepe is horrible. Pepe is, is, is a, you know, is a threat to democracy. Absolutely. Designated as a hate symbol by the SPLC, I'll have you know. <laughs> it's true. By the way, you have to get me in on this racket because I really need yeah. $3 million. <laughs> <laughs> but Pepe, well, Pepe but, is now... But what we're learning about is, is that fundamentally <clears throat> these people um, see this as they've been in this little sort of sub-society, which is like witty and snarky to them, and they are highly empathic with themselves, and they're completely anti they have no empathy for anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you make any joke that isn't from their collective, they just think this is the worst thing. And mm -hmm. they want to tell us that we all need to be more empathic in the way that they are empathic, which is to transfer empathy from everybody in society evenly and, and invested in a tiny number of people who've won the intersectional Olympics uh, over oppression, and to take it away from everybody else who might be worthy. Well, when you start to def make these kinds of defenses, it is transparently obvious that you're not playing a fair game, right? You're admitting, when you're up for kill all men as a hashtag, which is like, okay, that's mildly offensive and that she probably shouldn't have done it, but then somebody else makes you know, black, black magic chocolates and, and they need to be guillotined. This is prima facie obvious. I want to remind people that in the United States we begin important documents like, we hold these truths to be self-evident. We don't explain these things. This is beneath analysis. This is transparently obvious. There are some places where you just set a recursion limit. And you say, if you're going around saying, kill all men, and you're also trying to enforce microaggressions uh, that, that, that they be stopped, that is the end of the argument. Mm. That is, you, you have effectively tapped out in the, in, in the language of adult conversation. And what we don't know is how this network has remained in these organs when they are effectively saying, we are completely full of it and cannot be trusted. Mm. I want to explore this, yeah. Mm. <clears throat> this question of microaggressions and what Douglas, you were just talking uh, about, about how anodyne and banal one's uh, creative output has to be if you're mm. terrified of triggering a tripwire. Has anyone seen the, the Reddit image of, uh, it, the caption is, uh, me trying not to offend someone when I tell a joke? And it's a picture of someone with all of those laser uh, beams, like, you know, in Mission Impossible, yeah. kind of contorted, like they're playing Twister, like so they don't touch the red line. And then underneath it, someone has responded, my mother was killed by a laser beam, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Sam, when you, you were on my podcast, We the People Live, which I hope everyone subscribes to, um, you were talking about this in is, the context. Is the one with Hannibal Burris that went No, so it well, wasn't. Or? It was the other. Okay. Um, it, was, it was the other, one of the other episodes that you were on where yeah. you were. Um, I was running you through some memes. If you Google, if you do a Google image search for Sam Harris, what comes up are a, a just a treasure trove of photos of him looking sinister, maybe with red, uh, maybe like turned red with the, the, the blood coming down your face or something, mm. and things that you've said that people regard as being totally outrageous. Right. And I sort of read some you of these things. You can see I've been following Douglas's advice <laughs> quite well. Yeah. <laughs> and saying the thing that can't be misrepresented. And you were, and you were saying that there are certain, that, that it would be impossible to be a, a sparkling and interesting writer. If, you were, if, you were, if your uh, criterion for yourself was that you were never going to write anything that could be intentionally right. misrepresented and taken out of context, yeah. how do you deal with that? Well, I, the truth is, as Douglas gave us each iteration of this, that the, the final one is truly Im impossible to defend yourself against. I mean, it's just someone who is hell-bent on misleading people as to what your position actually is will find some way to do that, no matter how... how anodyne your writing is or isn't. So it's, it's I mean, so I, I've cleaned up my, honestly, I've cleaned up my speech and writing a little bit because 
some hassles just aren't worth it. So in, insofar as you can foresee the hassle in real time coming your way as, as you're mm -hmm. forming each sentence, it's, you know, I, I found it useful to just be aware of not making life needlessly difficult for myself. And that comes at some expense, I mean, because there, there, there's some, there is a lack of color and a lack of uh, just uh, f fun right. and freedom in the act of communication. When you, when you can assume a, a modicum of intelligence and goodwill uh, from, uh, on, on the part of your audience, and you can assume that the people who are following the plot will defend you adequately against mm. the people who are maliciously misrepresenting you, well, then you're kind of free to just to, to have fun on the high wire a little yeah. bit. But it's becoming, I mean, I, you know, it's got, gotten so bad with respect to my podcast that there are people who will edit the audio of my podcast so as to make it sound like I'm saying the opposite of what I was saying in context. So it's just, and, and, so, and then there are people who will broadcast those edits to millions of people, and there's no, there is no defense against that except to have a large enough audience that cares to, to push back against it so that there's, there's this kind of ambient groan whenever that happens and, and people notice. But it's a, it is a, it's a bad job to have, to have to do it oneself. And in fact, it's, you know, I'm now convinced it's, it's almost always counterproductive to defend yourself because it, it makes, one, it, it just, it's, it's boring for all the people who are following the plot and who understand that, you know, in, in my case, I'm not a racist and misogynist and, and advocate of you know, genocide against all Muslims or whatever. These are, these are kind of the greatest hits of my uh, detractors. Uh, so the, uh, for me to say yet again in some form, whether it's an article or a podcast or a public talk, listen, I, you know, I don't actually want to annihilate hundreds of millions of people with nuclear weapons today. You know, that's, that's not my position. That happens next you know, Tuesday. You know, right. Yes, no, that's, you know, a few things would have to happen before we would have that conversation about uh, mass genocide. So, um, th the people who know that you're not a genocidal maniac don't need to hear you take that particular foot out of your mouth again and again. And uh, the people who are committed to thinking you're a terrible person are, are truly incorrigible. They're, they're, they're unreachable. And uh, some of them have very large platforms. I mean, some, you know, they're, they're, they're people who will never ap apologize. Even if when they do it inadvertently, there are people who will never apologize for getting something catastrophically wrong in, in terms of damaging a person's <laughs> reputation. So it is unwinnable, and what you, you, you continually send the message that you are spending all your time concerned about your reputation and, and, and the misrepresentations of, of things you've said. And, you, and you, it, it, it clogs up your, your bandwidth so much that you, at, at every moment it's a for, forced choice between cleaning up someone else's mess, which took them like five seconds to create, or doing profitable and interesting work <laughs> yourself. And so I, I'm making much more, uh, I'm making the choice. It's not even a choice anymore because the truth is, having pulled back from social media to the degree that I have, I don't even see these small fires that, that are getting mm. set all the mm. time. And what's interesting about the, the Sarah Jong thing is that I think most people who are not on Twitter have no idea about this story. Mm. I mean, this, this, this was a confection largely of social media. The book, the pushback, the, the her, you know, her transgressions, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, all of the, the carping about the double standard at the Times. I mean, it, maybe it's appeared in, in, in the Atlantic or some, some other real journal, but, you know, whenever, whenever I mention this to some way, because the truth is, I barely saw it, because I pulled back enough from Twitter that I, you know, I saw it, but I, you know, it was Wait, not something I was But you have to be careful here, Sam, because in part, your pulling back from social media is a comment which is like, you know, most of the stuff doesn't really matter. And in the case of Sarah Jong, if what you're saying is true, and I think it is somewhat true, it really matters and thank God for social media in the, that particular instance. So you can't say either Twitter isn't real life, no, right? because yeah. sometimes it really is the only thing covering something. And then in other cases, you can get sucked into some you know, shit storm that just absolutely doesn't, doesn't matter. And so if you're, if you're blissing out on meditation, you can, you can afford to go right through it. <laughs> well, that was no, a low it, blow. It's, it's actually what? worse than that, though, because no, it, it, is, it is real life. See, I, I'm in the uncomfortable position of knowing that 
most of my life is, in fact, online. I mean, my, most of my reputation is online. Most of the, anything that could happen materially to harm my career would be happening online. And, if I'm, and, and yet, I find the return to sanity, uh, uh, born of not paying much attention to it, so valuable that it's like, that, you know, it's... I think all you're saying is what you said to me in, um, when we had dinner in, uh, in London mm. during the World Cup final that right. we, we lost. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're saying that you deactivated it from your phone. Right. So you're not constantly, how you ruined your family holiday because you were responding to Ezra Klein yeah. on your tweets yeah. and, the, and, and, you know, you had your wife and kids there. So what you're saying is taking it off your phone is not that you're disengaging completely No, but I've, di I've disengaged to the point where it's like, I, I was, because it was on my phone, I was probably checking it, I don't know, some humiliating number of times a day. I mean, it had to be thir <laughs> 30 times a day. Yeah. And I don't know how many, how much time that uh, accrued each day, but it was, it was considerable. And it, again, it felt totally justified. This is, this is my job to pay attention to. I'm following all kinds of smart people. I'm following all of you. I see the articles you think I should read. I go ahead and read those articles. It seems incredibly useful. And then I see all the sniping that, that eventually produces something which I think, well, fuck, I have to respond to this, right? This is, <laughs> this is beyond the pale. And then, you know, and Ezra Klein was one of those, right? Um, and, but then I see that even in the best case, when one of these, you know, skirmishes of out that takes hours or days that results in blog posts or podcasts or something, when, even when it resolves in a way that seems as satisfying as possible to me and my side, right, where I feel like, oh, well, I, you know, I finally, uh, I finally put that to rest, at best, it's getting back to zero for me. Mm. It's like, it's not like, you know, even when you're winning, on some level, you're still an asshole. And that's, and, and again, I say that knowing that things of real consequence, like, what, I mean, what was so phantasmagorical about that episode on, uh, with Ezra Klein was that I was, because I was on vacation and trying to salvage what yet remained of a, of a vacation, um, I was, you know, just paying attention to social media out of the corner of my eye, right? And that was enough to, that, that was the worst possible way to sp split the baby, because I was still responding, but doing it ineptly, because I wasn't actually totally following the plot. Um, but the... Now I've, now I've actually lost the plot in my own head. <laughs> can I, uh, can I, can I uh, Brett, yes. Brett jump in and then, and then Douglas. Yeah, been, so I want to try to synthesize a little bit of what I think we're learning here because there's a big punchline and it has to do with the fact that social media and YouTube are so new that we don't yet know the rules of how to wisely interact with these things. And so I think you're soon to discover that you've solved one problem and you will have created another and when it comes for you, you're going to figure out how to navigate. Right. Oh, let me do, so before you jump in, let me sure. just finish the thing I forgot to say is that, that I then had the surreal experience because I was not paying attention to social media uh, and I was, quote, living in the real world, right? So now I'm like back, I'm back at the pool with my family and, you know, everything is fine, I think. But now I'm getting emails from people who I haven't heard from in a very long time saying, I just, just wanted to reach out and say, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. <laughs> Right, and these are those are very <laughs> ominous emails. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially when you're not paying attention. Like, there's a type the of friend who will, there's a type of friend who will always alert you to a bad review. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, I'm so sorry oh, to no. see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Britt, just finish finish that thought. Yeah. So I just wanted to say, so uh, Majid and Douglas both said something resonated very strongly for me, which is if. I am endangered by saying these things. Mm. What is it like for somebody who doesn't have the position that I have to, to say them? And I went through this exact thing. When I decided to challenge the phony equity coalition at Evergreen, I thought explicitly, I discussed with Heather the fact that I believed my record was so clean on the topic of race and that mm. I had everything I needed to defend myself that I was in fact safe enough to take the risk. What I now know is that I would have been annihilated but for Dave Rubin, right. Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, and Eric. And that those forces actually produced enough 
counter-narrative online to save me from what would have been my fate absent those mechanisms. Mm. So that is a very important discovery. And I think what it says is that most people actually simply do not have the firepower. They don't have the record that will allow them to defend themselves against some mm. of these stigmas. And what is necessary <laughs> is that we figure out how to engineer our way around that problem. But, uh, so, uh, 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 Douglas has been, well, <laughs> has been yeah, yeah. waiting yeah. patiently yeah. Just to say, looking I mean, at me. I, I was about to make the same point as Brett was going to make, but just to refine it this way, I mean, the, the reason why so many people are going mad is, yes, we haven't found a way to deal with <coughs> speaking to the world. I mean, it is impossible to find the manner of speaking which could simultaneously be you and a few people in a room, you and the people at your dinner, and possibly everyone in the world. It's, 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 it's jokes are the most obvious one. There is no joke so funny that it can be repeated to everybody in the world all the time. Forever. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> and if there's, and we all know most jokes have some edge somewhere. Most of them are not gonna last five years, let alone et cetera. Et cetera. So, so, so jokes are the obvious one. The other one is, and I, I was very worried by what Sam said about that, about the, the self, same self-censorship, not self-censorship, but that thing of stepping back slightly, because what is, what is the problem for politics in all of our countries at the moment? It, it, what has produced this backlash in politics? It's that we've had a generation of politicians who can never say anything meaningful in front of people. I mean, I spend a certain amount of my life on shows with politicians, and I know, imagine those, that basically you see it in their eyes. Yeah. The aim is to survive the next half hour mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. without plausibly yeah, yeah, yeah. or otherwise being accused of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, or something else. And you can see it in the other politicians. There's no meaningful win. The hope is that the other person says something which allows you to say, I think that's quite offensive to X group of people. And then the person goes, oh, no. And then they're on the ropes, and you got them. And if you get enough other people, you destroy them, and they're dead. And, and that's it. And, and, and the point is, is that this is why politicians this can't could, this say anything. This could be anything. your effect on these politicians. But, okay. Yeah, it, it may be. It may be. But, 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 but the point is, is, is that this is why politics is going bad, because you can't tell any truth to, yeah, yeah. to that kind of audience. Now, the problem is, if down from politicians, or, or up from politicians maybe, you, you, you have the same effect, that the rest of the world also suffers the problem that politicians have of how to speak to everyone all the time. 